introduce our final design team, Janice. Uh, we are Project Janice, and we are formed by Cory Colón, Jessica Colón, and myself, Miguel Tovar. Um, I'm going to leave you now with Cory. He's going to talk to you about the mission of our book. All right, so we were given a, a, a set of owner requirements, and so our main mission was to meet the owner requirements regarding luxury, comfort, and uh, voyaging. Uh, another note would be that we were, we plan on uh, acting as a charter uh, as a chartering vessel as well, uh, rather than just simply a private yacht. So therefore, we have we would be certified as a passenger vessel and feature several handicap features such as elevators, spacious bathrooms, and wide passageways and doorways. Um, so in order to accommodate uh, the comfort and voyage requirements, we decided to provide a hull that had dual operating modes, such as a cat mode, which has uh, a shallow draft, and a cruising speed of about uh, 25 knots, and a swath mode that would be ballasted down up until a point where our area, uh, water plane area would be significantly reduced as it, um, as it handles better uh, against um, motions. There we go. All right, so now this is our profile of our vessel. Our lens is uh, 50 meters by 24 meters wide. Our draft at cat mode is three meters, and our draft at swath mode is 5.5 meters. We're able to accommodate um, 12 guests and uh, 18 crew. That's a good So after we had our mission for our boat, we had to check if there was a market for it. So we analyzed uh, some information by Bo International. So we compare the last five years, and these are annual super yachts, uh, new orders for super yachts, and Bo International considers super yachts private yachts that are 24 meters in length or longer. So if we compare uh, year 2010 to year 2014, this last uh, five years, we, we have seen a, an increase of a little over 100%. And also, by Boeing International Media, uh, the number of super jets that are under construction around the world right now is 734. <laughs> so, after we knew there was a uh, market for a boat, we performed a small parametric study. So, we compared a, a total of 40 swaths, and it's important to mention that we pay uh, we paid close attention to motor yacht Silver Cloud, which is the only yacht that is a swath out in the market. So. Since we knew our lens overall of uh, 50 meter by our earnest requirement, we were able to estimate an approximately 20 meters for our, for, uh, for our beam, which later changed after the design spiral to 24 meters. We also estimated an approximate draft of 5 meters, which uh, our uh, current draft is 5.5 meters. And also with the parametric study, we were able to determine uh, displacement of 1,100 tons. So that brings us into our hull and struts development. We analyzed typical forms for SWAS, but after analyzing, in, since we have dual operating modes in both CAT and SWAS mode, we had to get rid of the, the bottom three options. So that left us with option one and option two. And after performing some resistance and motion analysis, we, were, uh, we decided that option two was our best option. We also had to check the uh, typical pass for, for our jet. So since the owner wanted to cruise the world with our jet, we decided that pro the most probabilistic uh, it will be transatlantic. It will, the owner will be traveling from between the Caribbean and Europe. So after we had some visual reference, we reference ourselves to NATO standards, to the annual sea state occurrences in the open in the North Atlantic. These values are uh, offered in the PNA volume three, and we decided to design our SWAS for sea state five which have a most probabilistic wave height of 3.25 meters in a wave period of 9.7 seconds. So then we refer ourselves to some guidance for whole form selection for swash ships by Robert Lamb, and we decided to design for a tuning, fa tuning factor of around 1.3. So that means that our, uh, our swash mode would uh, platform up to sea state 5, and we, when, when we encounter wave uh, bigger than the, one, the ones we designed, our swash is going to start contouring those waves and follow the motion of the waves. So from that equation, from the heat period, the tuning factor is a ratio between the heat period and the period of encounter of the waves. So we were able to back out our area of the water plane required, and we came out with a 79.62 meters a squared. But it's also important to mention that on our uh, resistance estimate, we saw that we were getting uh, significant wave resistance at about a number of 0.4. 
So we decided to use the fruit number equation and back up our minimum for our design speed in swath mode, our minimum required length for our struts, which came up to be 16.85 uh, 16 meters. So after we have all this information, we were able to de design our final hole, which came out to be a water plane area of 78.63 meters squared, a strut length, each strut was 70 meters, a demi hole length of 50 meters, and each, do each hole having a demi hole width of 4.5 meters. <coughs> Now I'm going to leave you with a seat to talk about motion analysis. So the whole point of uh, this motion analysis was to show that our boat was going to behave better in SWAT mode. Uh, we used two different softwares, MaxSurf and Moses. The second one more, as more advanced, and the first one was more user friendly. <laughs> two different analysis method to a street theory and panel method. Uh, I wish I could have used a street theory just for making my point, but uh, uh, we didn't have any match with the between the the section the program was reading at the actual section in SWAT. We account here only for fuel cooldown terms. Meanwhile, with the panel method, we account for diffractions and drag. So we have two programs, two methods of analysis, two different operation modes, six degrees of freedom, different speeds, a whole lot of things going on. So we just, uh, we kind of constrain our analysis to a zero speed. And since I'm more familiar with the heat motions, I decided if I find agreement between uh, the results, uh, I should be in the right track. So here is uh, how MaxSurf are showing uh, difference between the prediction in the street mate theory and uh, panel model. But here, two different programs, two different methods, same conditions, and we kind of have a really close heat curve in uh, the RAO, so it means we are, we are in the right track. In that way, we, we, put, we were able to compare our uh, <coughs> heat response in CAD and in SWAT mode. As you can see, for head seas, uh we are finding a kind of a similar behavior. Uh, just neglect this part and we were, we were seeing a, a better behavior in SWAT mode for BMCs. Now here's the important part of the one why I want to point out the, the most. Uh, for our uh, rolling response, we are getting way better results for BMCs, which is our worst case scenario. And for the pitching, uh, let's say we are gonna find in, the, in a similar range. And this is supposed to be a uh, time domain animation, but it's not working right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our conclusions were, we're going to find for hints a better behavior in, in beam seas, a similar behavior in head seas. For rolling, we're going to have a, a, a really uh, better behavior, which you think about that is going to play an important role in the, in the six sickness. And in the pitch motion, we have a similar response. So we, was, we decided to go with film stabilizers to uh, account for this, pin, this pitch motion. And also it will help us to account for dynamic stabilities, uh, which are common in SWAT, in SWAT modes like the month moment. Now I'll leave you with Jorge in the resistance estimate. Thank you, Sid. So where to start? Uh, uh, as you can see, the uh, resistance estimate uh, prediction was really complex on, for, the, for our vessel since we have dual modes of operation. Uh, we started with a SWAT resistance prediction by using Michelet, which handles uh, bad marine vehicles. And then uh, for catamaran, since our, my uh, colleague uh, pointed out, uh, use MaxSurf resistance prediction because it's more user friendly and who doesn't like that. <laughs> uh, but then let's backtrack our results with NAFCAT. Uh, it has a, we, I decided I did some research and I uh, found out that our vessel, uh, our demi holes, uh, compared to our Series 64 pattern uh, mo uh, model, so we use that correlation, I used two empirical methods, Foon CRTS and Gene 1988, because it uses this particular Series 64 and uh, it accounts for a round bilge uh, semi uh, displacement uh, vessels. So as you can see, uh, Michelin interface here, uh, you know, not too, uh, not too pretty, but does the job. Uh, next, uh, it requires uh, you write a text file and uh, so forth. Uh, so 
we decided why now? You know, we don't know too much about SWAT, so let's tr why don't we try with two struts or three struts, uh, struts configuration? But from the get-go, since we uh, we decided to do our two options that we were evaluating uh, with two struts and three struts, both of them, the three struts perform really bad for resistance. This is due because of divergent waves take over uh, more than transverse waves, therefore imposing more resistance. Uh, so, as you can see, option one and option two have better results, but I'm still not clear to which one performs better in uh, for cab mode or so. Therefore, we decided to do a resistance with MaxSurf for catamaran. Uh, MaxSurf uses a uh, slender body method also. And the good thing about it is that it measures your model and it, it attaches a slender body mesh on it. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, you can see what's going on better, uh, and you can see better stuff uh, for the resistance. Okay, uh, we did the comparison for cat, uh, for catamaran mode, but uh, since we're doing the slender body method, it starts failing after 0 0.5 through number. Therefore, because it, it goes from a displacement uh, mode to semi-displacement. Therefore, but still, we have to make a show. We have to make a choice. Uh, so, we decided to, uh, you know, base our prediction from zero to zero point four fruit number, and we decided to stay with uh, option two since, you know, it's, uh, it provides better uh, weight piercing. So, we went. We then, after had a final selection for the hull, we went back and did a final resistance estimate uh, prediction for SWAT mode. As we can see here, the total resistance. Uh, is takes more uh, the wave resistance takes more of the total and be, uh, as compared to the viscous or the wave interference, which we're expecting to be a little bit bigger since uh, you know we're the dual uh, camera and um, swap and camera and dual mode. Then we went to NAFCAT. Uh, NAFCAT uh, helped us out with the camera better prediction uh, for resistance. Uh, we use these two methods uh, as I said before. Uh, the applicable range are here. And see, using series, uh, 64 parent hole, uh, <coughs> parent motor hole, and we see that we have uh, similar uh, in the half entrance angle, you know, round bilge, and uh, so forth. We then did a composite graph for the resistance. Uh, you know, uh, I decided to plot it against screw numbers instead of speed, which is the conventional one. So because that way we can observe the range better, uh, you know, where they fail and where the the other ones take over. So from here to here, uh, we use a slender body, then Hoon gives you a medium resist, uh, prediction, and then uh, the uh, Jing 1988 takes over. Uh, why do we want to stay in SWAT or catamaran? Why cannot we stay in just one mode all the time? So do we, since we're a hybrid vessel, uh, we decided to compare both resistance. Uh, therefore, we can see from here that both are really, uh, you know, they stay together up to this point, which is basically our transfer, uh, you know, we change modes. That was where we were expecting that. And we can see how SWAT starts increasing uh, exponentially a lot more than just CAD. So that's why we chose to transit in CAD instead of SWAT, and we use SWAT for, uh, you know, better sea keeping and you know, better uh, uh, comfortable ride. Propulsion estimate. We decided to do a conservative approach to the propulsion estimate. Uh, we got the, our effective power uh, right here, and then uh, I decided to, uh, you know, uh, take a in NAFCA, take a conservative approach. Then uh, I plotted my total uh, effect, uh, overall propulsion efficiency. As, as we can see, uh, we go from uh, 0.5 to 0.6. Uh, which is normal for our range, and uh, then we came out with a total brake power here. So, for our power plant selection, uh, from the get-go we had two options that we were uh, evaluating uh, as compared to other because we had a lot of space constraints. We have, uh, you know, we evaluated all uh, everything based on cost, weight, compatibility, maintenance, uh, and uh, reliability. Therefore, uh, our, you know, we have 
our main ones that we decided to do were uh, gear diesel drive, you know, normal uh, for our, our design, and then diesel electric. Now this one we eliminated because we needed more equipment, it was more weight, and we were really critical on that, so we decided to go with a conventional diesel gear drive. For propulsor, uh, we evaluated a controllable pitch, fixed pitch, and uh, asymptote thrusters. Uh, so we decided to go with a controllable pitch because that way we could keep our engine running at the highest efficiency and just uh, change the pitch for the difference uh, in speeds that we want to achieve. Uh, engine selection, uh, medium uh, to high speed engine, uh, we decided to go with an MTU uh, 16B uh, 1163 M74. Uh, based on our uh, you know hours of operation, we decided it was going to be a, a 1B rating. Uh, and from here, uh, this you can see the engine pocket uh, from provided by the manufacturer, and then we match our power needed in order to make our selection. Therefore, this engine proved to be the better choice for our design. For a gearbox selection, uh, we went with a CF Marine gearbox with a ratio of 2.464, and that was pretty common. Uh, the, the good thing about it is really light. So it was a for our CPP propellers. We went uh, with Halsey, a company that does that. They provide a lot of. Uh, yeah, we did some studies, and they turns out that they help uh, gats and stuff with uh, CPP uh, propeller uh, the the signs. And uh, so, well, I still I needed to some uh, confirmation and some. So I decided to plot a pitch, CPP pitch uh, versus speed. This is going to be a difference uh, for uh, you know. A, different pitch modes. Uh, the maximum diameter is going to be uh, 2 meters. Next. Uh, now I'm going to go really quickly over the general arrangement. Uh, on our lower deck, we have our accommodation for a total of 17 crew. We have our uh, tender storage. We can be The boats can be unloaded from each side of the boat port in starboard. We also have, we encounter here our main galley, which have a, a access to all the levels of the yacht by a private stairwell, which only the crew have access, and also dumb waiters. And we also have our uh, emergency generator, pump rooms, and we also have our main uh, technical and storage space. Moving up one more level, we have our accommodation for our guests. We have on this level accommodation for a total of ten, uh, 10 guests. We have our VIP suite, which are on foldable, ba on foldable balcony. And we also have uh, special features uh, such as uh, a theater, a spa and a sauna, and a crew gym. And Notice our also ample use of uh, pool lounge area on the aft of the vessel. One more level, we encounter our uh, helicopter landing pad and the owner's suite, each of with a his and her bathroom, and also our cosmic dining. And lastly, under our bridge deck, we have our control room, which accommodates uh, the captain's crew, uh, crew quarter, and we also have our hot tub, which have access from both either the elevator or the stairwell from the deck below. So this is a elevation view to provide you with a better uh, visualization of our boat. This is a midship uh, section on the upper part of the boat, and this is a typical uh, center line cut uh, on one of the demi holes. So we can see our axis. Uh, we have axis either from an incline ladder on the forward strip and vertical ladder on the aft strip. So that brings us to machinery arrangement. On the forward part, we located our bow thrusters. After that, we have our pump room and our front, uh, front fin stabilizers. We have also our main generator rooms and where the uh, very, uh, inclined ladders arrive from the uh, tender garage. We have our main engines and our gearbox, and our auxiliary room, which have our uh, aft uh, fin stabilizers, and our stern thruster room, which accommodates our rudder room and the stern thrusters. So now I'm going to leave you with Corey to talk you about tank capacity. Okay, so as Miguel mentioned earlier, we knew that our that we wanted to voyage from the Caribbean to the European uh, to Europe, which is roughly 3,500 nautical miles. So, going, we, we figured we'd travel at an average speed of 20 knots, which is uh, in between our speeds for both modes, and we figured we'd be operating 24 hours a day, which gave us a duration, a required duration of seven days. However, we decided to add an extra day of margin to decide our um, our capacities to. So keeping in mind our duration and our capacity, uh, consumption factors, 
we came up with required capacities, and as, as you can see, our current tank capacities all uh, meet or further exceed what's required. So now I'm gonna move on to the tank arrangement. So this is the level, I don't know if you remember seeing from the profile cut, the center, uh, the inboard cut. This is the, the level uh, below deck on the main hull that includes our fresh water, gray water, black water, and uh, all of our needed ballast. And then moving on down into our, our demi hulls, we have fuel stored in the struts, wing tanks, and inner bottoms, as well as our lube oil, waste oil, and a sea chest. Uh, we got two sets, set, set of rules for our approach. The first one, uh, the, the one governing our design was high speed craft, uh, 250. The second one was a 1999 guide for uh, building and classing SWAT vessels. However, we found that uh, this set of rules was too much finite element analysis oriented. So we use it as a guidance only and we'll be uh, helpful in, a, in a another state of the design. We went for aluminum alloy and 6166. We chose this one because we find it, there is availability in the plate thicknesses, uh, a, a good way to a strain ratio, uh, widely applicable to the marine industry. However, we, we also know that that will be a factor to consider the weldability of this material. So here's the midship, midship section we came out with. Um, you can divide it into two parts, a really heavy and complex one and a really light and easy to, to build, that will help us to our modular uh, building process. Um, <coughs> we went longitudinally framed, even though uh, longitudinally bending wasn't our major concern here. Um, however, that will, be, that will be easier to, to build the deep members this way than the other one. Uh, we use double bottoms here and here to account for our transversal uh, stresses. Uh, we also did a little bit of a span optimization. Since we were uh, way critical in cat mode, uh, we decreased as much as we could the, the, the weight of our structures uh, here. Um, our worst case PCG will be located around here, considering we have uh, superstructures. So it's helping us to keep our stability in the good range. And for the transversal moments, we just account for the uh, transversal bulkheads located in the, in the hull, and we still pass the, the requirement as per the rules. Weight and general priority. So knowing our general arrangement, our structural arrangement, and our equipment selection, we were able to develop a, a highly detailed uh, weight breakdown. This is a summary of our weight breakdown. So you can see we have our outfitting and our structures. And this includes several margins, uh, major margins such as 10% uh, for joiner and 10% for production. There's also a kg margin of six inches that we added on top of that. So this leaves us with a light ship total of 455 metric tons. And our dead weight uh, came out to be roughly 10 tons and that includes uh, provision, passengers, um, spares, et cetera. And so uh, now we can move on to stability. So knowing that our vessel was gonna be operating in the Caribbean, we decided to pick <coughs> a, a flag state of um, Cayman Islands. And they require that you follow the large yacht code according to uh, MCA. Um, so we also followed the, since our vessel is gonna be traveling internationally, we followed IMO's code of uh, high speed craft for cat mode, as well as, took it, as well as we took into account the intact stability code. And we also, followed the CFR since this vessel could possibly charter in the US. So we came up with uh, three loading conditions for each operating condition, and this includes uh, uh, departure, mid-voyage, and arrival, and th which means that we have 100% consumables, 50% consumables, and 10% consumables, respectively. So once we loaded our vessel, we got our um, some hydrostatics and found our VCGs, and from there, we were able to place them on our composite curve. And so this curve was developed using uh, all the criteria, as I mentioned before, but more specifically intact criteria, such as riding, weather, um, high speed turning, and passenger yield, as well as damage stability. And this was ran at a trim, uh, trim range of plus or minus 1.5 meters.
So I took the worst case scenario and plotted a, a curve, and as you can see, since all of them fall under the curve, we are considered to pass stability. And so this is another uh, interesting curve. I just wanted to compare the um, our riding arm curves between the cat mode and the swap mode. So as you can see, we have a slight shift, and that's due to our uh, difference in VCG. Um, but mainly, I wanted to point out the few points, like point two, how it dips right there. That's right where the, um, the side shell or the upper part of the hole starts to submerge. And then we get this rapid increase in our uh, riding arm. However, at point three on cat mode, that's where the strut starts to um, starts to emerge, and then right at four, that's similar to point two, where the side shell starts to emerge and has that same shape. At point five, we have our max uh, riding arms, which is pretty much where the, um, the, the hole that's emerging pretty much comes to the surface, and then from there on out, your, your stability just gradually starts to decrease up until you're roughly 85 degrees sealed over, so that gives you a, a positive um, stability range of uh, roughly 85 degrees. And now Jorge will discuss electrical loop. So after doing an electrical load analysis of the equipment, uh, we have four modes of operation. Uh, two of them is uh, cruising, uh, one four and uh, the emergency one. Now, since we're going green with our design, we decided to include solar panels. So whatever we say from our the, uh, square uh, uh, meter area, mm -hmm. so we, the, you know, subtract that from whatever our, our needs are. So as we can see, uh, uh, these two modes are very similar to each other since they're both cruising. So from an electrical load analysis, we uh, uh, selected two uh, northern light generators, uh, marine generators, you know, uh, frequency 60 hertz, uh, total power output of 355. So we have two of these uh, and a power factor of 0 0.8. This one is the emergency generator with a total power output of 99 kilowatts and a power factor of 0 0.8. Now, uh, we can see here how we meet our power demand. Uh, in port, we only need one genset uh, to meet the power demand. Uh, in CAD and SWAP mode, uh, we'll meet it uh, with the two, uh, two gensets uh, continu uh, continu uh, continu continuously, and then uh, emergency, uh, the emergency generator will take over. Now we can see here, taking into account the power factor for the generators, how much margin we have for, uh, you know, for the uh, for the load uh, in the in each in each uh, genset, and therefore uh, give us a good power margin. Next cost estimate we'll see. Finally, our cost estimate. Uh, based on our weight estimate, we came up with a great total of about fifty-eight million dollars. <laughs> so uh, from there, uh, it's representative of 25 percent uh, of our bidding, which actually makes sense because we are luxury yet, and also our 30 percent of uh, uh, arrangements. However, we want to make sure we were not just in the wrong place. So we we approached this with three checkpoints. First was uh, Dubrovsky's multi-hull ships book. Uh, he gave us a price per ton. Uh, I just bring this value to, a, to, to the present and, <clears throat> and input my displacement in light shift weight. I, I came up with these two blue lines here. Uh, we also asked guys in the jazz industry to say, okay, how much could cost a, 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 a model like that? He, the, the approach was, okay, you are going uh, over 160 feet, like 48 meters. You go a million per meter of length, plus or minus 20%. So here is the rate, the rate uh, lower and upper limit. And we are right here, we are the green ones. So <laughs> I think we are not far from there. However, we wanna, we wanna look how, uh, how we look in the market. And we plot a little uh, uh, four similar length jets. Still they are monohulls. Well, even though we are in the upper level, we still feel competitive since all the capabilities we have. Thank you very much. Thank you.